Hi, I'm Clifton Smithers. I live in Belito, where my partners and I run a business called Union 3. As a family, we chose to move here about six years ago. What attracted us to the area was the safe and relaxed lifestyle of the North Coast. We're surrounded by so much natural beauty and we love that it's so casual. It's just not as intense as a busy city. In fact, that's one of the main reasons there's so many people moving into the area. There's some amazing lifestyle estates out here. We've got some Bali, Brettonwood Estate, and Zimbiti, to name a few. The Belito Lifestyle Centre caters to everyone's needs. There's also some smaller commercial centres like Tiffany's and Salt Rock. There's some excellent restaurants to choose from, and there's a really wide variety of activities on offer. From mountain biking out on the trails to surfing at any one of the beaches, there really is something for everyone. This quiet little town really comes alive over the weekend. The live concerts in the farmer's market at the Leachy Orchard is very popular. With the new international airport just 15 minutes down the road and the unmatched lifestyle that this place offers, it's no wonder that the North Coast is the fastest growing town in South Africa. My family and I absolutely love it here, and this is our neighbor. and welcome to episode 38 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzabantu Kumal. And a lot of us who are either property entrepreneurs, property investors, perhaps even aspiring property entrepreneurs and investors always want to know how we can either A, get our foot into the property ladder, but the very big one is B, how can we do so when we don't have capital? And to help us better understand this and really give us some of the tips and tools that we can use to enable us in our property journey. This evening, I'll be speaking to Nigel Adrianzo, who's the CEO of the Enterprise Development Property Fund. But before we get into that competition, or rather before we get into that conversation, uh, of course, we are running that YouTube competition where all you have to do to stand a chance of winning that 1,000 Rand price on Friday is subscribe to our YouTube channel. So all you have to do is go to YouTube or subscribe to the private property YouTube channel and you stand a chance of winning one of two 1,000 Rand prizes. And of course, all you need to do is take that screenshot, share it down below and you stand a chance of being a winner. And we'll be announcing that those two winners who are going to walk away with that 1,000 Rand prize right here on Friday um, on the private property podcast. But Without any more delay, I'm going to introduce Nigel. Nigel, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Zama, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. So I think one of the big things is, you know, people are probably wondering, wondering you know, am I even able to start my property journey or tap into the property space when I don't have my own capital. I mean, a lot of us, and certainly even on the show, we've been helping people who presumably either have capital or have access to capital. And for the most part have access to capital in terms of bank financing. 
But of course, there are different types of ways that people can access financing when it comes to you know financing those property deals. And so when people even hear that concept of you know raising money or starting without capital, what would your starting point be to entrepreneurs who say, is that even possible? I mean, is that even a thing? So absolutely, Zama. Um, you've had a number of guys that we are well connected with, uh, people from Sapin and from Empire Property Addicts um, and the like that have been on your show. And I'm sure that almost all of them will probably tell you exactly the same thing I'm going to tell you tonight. It does not matter that you do not have your own capital. Um, we teach at the academy, we teach our entrepreneurs and our candidates exactly that. One of the big things we teach is how to raise capital if you yourself do not have any money. And I think then let's probably dig into the academy. I mean, if, if somebody hears about the Enterprise Development Property Fund, what work exactly does it do? So I don't want to talk too much about the academy tonight. Obviously, we want to tap into the, the conversation on raising capital. But uh, just briefly, um, the Enterprise Development Property Fund is an impact fund. And our academy um, helps entrepreneurs who are historically disadvantaged, who do not have the capital or the know-how on how to get involved in the property sector. We teach them how to do that. Um, there are 14 different disciplines that we teach. Um, and people can go to our website to see what they are. But in effect, we teach uh, topics like property management, facilities management, energy efficiency, water management, and a whole range of other things. But our main uh, uh, focus is to teach guys, um, ladies and gents, let's not be sexist, um, how to get involved and buy their first property. Um, we're a very practical institute. Uh, we do obviously do a lot of classroom stuff, and now with the lockdown, we have gone fully digital, so we're teaching um, all our candidates online at the moment, but we, we do like to have the face-to-face -face, uh, engagements. We have the classroom engagements, um, and we've got lots of exams and, and topics to discuss. Et cetera, et cetera. However, at the end of the day, even after the course is complete and the course is three years long, we make sure that every single one of our entrepreneurs has bought their first property and walks away with their first property. That ultimately for me is the graduation ceremony. That they don't get a certificate, but a title deed. So even though they do get certificates for the courses that they do, um, and an overall venture creation certificate, at the end of the three years, the title deed is the most important. And my, um, what I always say to the guys, if I cannot get you to a point where you've got your first property, then you have not failed this course. I, as an educator, have failed you. And I think, you know, perhaps share with us some of the success stories um, that you have, because before we even look at how to raise funds, what must you should be, uh, or rather what you should be looking out for, perhaps share some of the success stories that you've had with the academy, because as we're saying, one of the big value propositions that certainly is important for you is for candidates who've walked through the path or walked through the program for them to be, to have that property at the end of that journey. Uh, do you have any success stories that really just stand out for you that you'd like to share with us? Well, yeah, where do I start? We've had so many of our entrepreneurs. Um, we've only now been fully operational for three years. So this year, in fact, is going to be our first graduation ceremony. I left corporate in 2016, where I was the senior asset manager for the big list of fund property fund. Um, and in 2017, we started this journey. 2018, we took on our first cohort, who this year will graduate. That group already a number of them have um, already purchased property. Some of them are doing developments, some small and some large developments. I have one candidate um, who is a black lady, um, who's, I think she's now 34 years old. She was in construction, but could never break the glass ceiling in terms of becoming a developer. And effectively what then happened was over the last three years, I've been walking around with her so that this year she is now finally able to purchase her first two parcels of land 
where she will not be the, the, the person doing the construction, but she'll actually be the developer and own the two centers that she's busy building. So mm -hmm. by the end of this year, those two centers will be um, on the way in terms of the development itself. And hopefully in the next 18 months, she will have both those two centers, they both small retail centers, um, and uh, then she'll actually own, as opposed to just being the construction company that has built something for someone else. And I've got much uh, smaller deals where our candidates, um, even in our first year, um, I have one candidate who's a trench digger at uh, ESCOM. Um, and before he came to our program, never thought that he could be a property investor. He lives in Kailicha, um, has an RDP house, and uh, or, or what used to be called RDP houses, um, lives in, the, in this RDP house, and came to a realization that through his um, facility at uh, ESCOM, he could actually purchase another property and then use that property as an investment property, which is now finalizing the negotiations. He's got his bond approved, and hopefully within the next uh, two weeks, the deal will be concluded, and he will then within, say, let's call it six weeks, depending on, obviously, the opening of the deeds office, be able to take transfer of these very first property. So we, we range from the, the smallest uh, one unit um, single residential to retail shopping centers. That's sort of the, the, the gamble, you know, the, the length of and breadth of what we do. And we've had a number of success stories where, where people have come with nothing and walked away and in fact still walking the journey because we haven't graduated anybody yet but actually already have concluded the first deals. Uh, to our viewers at home, if you just joined us, you are, of course, tuned into episode 38 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamandunga Kumale. Today, we're talking about, you know, unlocking some of the tools and the tips in the event where you are a property entrepreneur and you don't know how to go about raising capital and you want to find out how to best do that and to help us better understand how we can do that i'm joined by nigel adirance who's the ceo of the enterprise development property fund now nigel let's get to you know raising capital i think it can be such a daunting um experience for so many viewers at home i think even myself included um, i mean oftentimes people say you know must go to your friends and family but the reality is a lot of us simply don't have friends and family who have that kind of equity uh, or, or rather what liquid in that way uh, and so reaching out to them simply isn't an option they're probably in the same predicament if not worse than we are in what are some of the first considerations that one should be thinking of when they're a property entrepreneur or perhaps even an aspiring property entrepreneur and they're thinking i need to find ways to raise capital but they simply don't know where to start all right so, uh, yeah. so yeah like i said um, i didn't want to talk too much about edpf let's get into it um, there are a number of ways in which one can raise capital without having any money. However, in order to get there, you need to be able to build up a track record. You need to be able to gain some experience. You need to uh, make some connections with different uh, uh, people and organizations in order for you to find that first deal. Finding that first deal is probably the most important thing. Because if you find the right deal and the return on your on the investment that your, your partners are going to put in, um, if the return is good, the money will follow. Um, my father-in-law always used to say to me, um, if, if your deal is good, your money will follow. So that's where I get it from, from my father-in-law. Um, and that helps too. Whenever you do a good deal, the money will always follow. There are, like I said, there are many, many ways in which you can raise capital. Obviously, the very first place you're going to try and look is your bank. The bank, their business is to lend money. That's what they do. Um, so they make their money by having you pay for bank fees, but where they make the most money is lending you money so that you can pay them back interest. So that's the business. So if you want money, that's the first place you're going to look. Obviously, if you don't have the capital to um, put up uh, your 20% or 30% or even 10% deposit, 
you're not going to require somebody else to come and stand with you in order to help you to raise that additional money. Um, if the bank won't give you any money, then obviously you have to find other ways. And like I said, if you've got a good deal, it would be reasonably easy to convince somebody to come in with you and fund the deal. You need to find the deal. That's the main uh, key to becoming a good property investor uh, to begin with when you don't have your own bank. And we're going to go for a quick break and take some of those questions and comments coming in from viewers at home. And after the break, um, what I want us to look at, Nigel, is now you have the deal. What's next? So you've gone around, you've gone to privateproperty.co.za, and you've been on the website for the past couple of weeks, maybe a past couple of months, and you come across a really great, maybe a small block of flats, or even one, you know, one apartment where you think this could be the one, you know the area relatively well because you've been monitoring it for an extended period of time. And you're even in touch with the estate agent, you're able to bullishly negotiate that price and you're happy with the price that you're about to get. And now you're ready, um, you know, to start looking for that funding. So you found the, the right property, as it were, that you think is going to give you good returns. How do you then raise that capital for that particular property? We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be looking at that and some of your questions and comments. We'll be back just after this. Welcome back to episode 38 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamantongwa Kumalo. This evening, we're looking at the tools to kickstart your property portfolio without capital and exploring the Enterprise Development Property Fund and to help us better understand what those tools are, what those tricks are, and how we can go about securing those property deals without capital. I'm joined by Nigel Adrianse, who is the CEO of the Enterprise Development Property Fund. Now, Nigel, before the break, I did say, you know, now we've got... Uh, our entrepreneur who's got the deal and he's quite happy he's you know effectively run his numbers in terms of what he think he's going to make from buying that property uh, from buying that particular property and he's very clear that look this is going to essentially be that cash cow that first property um, that will really uh, you know serve me well in the coming months or the coming years what is then the next step in terms of them trying to essentially get that capital Okay, um, Zama, yeah, thank you again for having me. And uh, effectively, the, to, to try and raise capital for a property depends, uh, and the way you can go about it, depends on what type of deal it is. So if it's a straightforward deal where it's one house and you're just going to rent it out to a family, then, um, then it's really about whether your cash flow that you're getting in in terms of your rental income is enough cover your bond and any other expenses like your municipal accounts and maintenance and whatever other costs um, uh, come your way. So that's really the key. Then you need to understand um, the, invest, the type of investor that you're going to bring on board. Are you going to bring a partner on board? And if it's a partner, um, what percentage are you going to give away? What are you willing to give away in terms of the profits or the business? Um, what, uh, whether it's a family member or a friend or a colleague. Um, so those are the kinds of people that you can go to if, it's, if you're going to put a partnership together. If it's, a, if it's a bigger deal, obviously then you need to raise development capital 
if it's a development or if it's a, um, a big uh, block of, of flats, then you're going to maybe have to raise commercial finance and you then have to go to the commercial banks uh, for commercial financing. However, they will also, even if you do get money from the bank, they will require you to put in some kind of um, uh, equity, some kind of cash, what they call skin in the game. Because if you have no skin in the game, then um, an investor or a bank or anybody else will not really be interested in you because they think you're just trying to do a deal, but you're not actually putting anything in. But if you don't have any money, then your time is the skin in the game that you are putting in. So really it's about what value you, you uh, put towards your time and then analyzing the value versus the cash that you require from others. Once you've been able to uh, do that and you, and you then assess what the, your value is versus the cash that's coming in, or not your personal value, but the time that you've spent, you then need to do what they call a feasibility study, which then uh, tells you what the return on the investment is. Once you've done the feasibility study, you put a pitch deck together or a proposal or even a, a full business plan, depending on how big the deal is. You then take that business plan or pitch and you then try and convince the people that you've gathered around you to put money into the deal. You then say you want X percentage and typically that can be anywhere from 10% all the way up to 50% of the deal. And the equity partners who put in the cash, they will then take anywhere from 50% to 90%, depending obviously on the structure of the deal. But that's sort of the rough idea of how you go about um, approaching your investors. Now, um, there's a book which I would highly recommend, written by Anton Rattenbach. It's called 15 Proven Ways. Um, you can get it. It's only 200 bucks at 15provenways.com or .co.ca. I'm not 100% certain. You just have to uh, Google 15 Proven Ways by Anton Rattenbach. That book talks about the 15 typical ways to raise capital. There's obviously bank finance. There's uh, guarantees. Um, you can use other people as guarantor to get a bank loan. You can get equity partners through venture capital um, associations or organizations. You can get an angel funder to come and invest with you. You can get a partnership with friends and family um, and a whole host of other ways. So if you have a look at that book, you will see the 15 ways um, I can, uh, what I can even do for you. I can send you um, just one sheet, a spreadsheet that you, or, or a PowerPoint presentation that you could then uh, just make available to anybody that requests it, or they can even e email me and I can just send them those 15 ways. But basically, there are these, these 15 ways that you can look at raising capital if you don't have any. The main point is that you have to bring the time, the energy, and the deal. That's the bottom line. And, and I think, Nigel, you know, a lot of our viewers, we've got quite a number of questions coming in and even comments around this issue. And a lot of them want to know a few specifics. I think uh, we've got okay. a question here coming in from Lerato CXC, the idea who, who says, Nigel, as an entrepreneur, you know how difficult it is to receive personal loan or fi finance or funds rather for the good deal property from a bank, which alternative programs or which alternatives programs and or institutions can young South African entrepreneurs explore to, re to raise the needed funds? So what are some of the alternatives that you would recommend to, to our viewers at home, especially young South Africans who are entrepreneurs? So they're hundred percent correct. It is extremely difficult for a young entrepreneur to raise capital if you have no um, asset base yourself. Because one of the things that you must always remember when you try and get a loan from an institution, they will always want guarantees. Now, if you have no cash and you've got no capital, you don't have an asset base, then you have no guarantees. Because normally, if you go to a bank, for example, they will say they want what they call a one and a half or two or three uh, or two and a half times the loan facility. They want that as guarantee. Um, depending obviously on your risk 
uh, profile. Yeah. So that's what they look at. They look at your risk profile as an individual, as an entrepreneur, etc. So really, the beginning, when you start out, what you're trying to do is to build an asset base. But then, Nigel, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Nigel. I think the, the okay. global sentiment is how do they, you know, start that out? Or what okay. are those alternatives? Because I, I, yeah. I get a sense certainly from the comments coming in is a lot of them have knocked on, you know, a lot of banks' doors and have been turned away and essentially now looking for those alternatives that they can um, okay. tap into in order to raise that capital. Yeah. So w- the point I was trying to make is in order to get there, um, to get to that point where the bank will actually accept you as a client and they won't um, turn you away anymore, is to build up that reputation. So the ways that you do it, it, it is a hard graft. Let me make no bones about it. It's a hard graft to get to that point. But the people that you surround yourself with, you need to surround yourself with people and get into networks where there are people looking for deals. People with money generally don't have time to go and find the deals. So you need to surround yourself with those kinds of people. You need to go to networking events. I personally don't run networking events, but people like the second um, epic, um, uh, 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 Anton's uh, group, um, in my love, sorry, sorry, Anton. <laughs> um, those guys run these events where you will find investors that potentially could come in with you. Alternatively, you need to connect with your family, your friends, um, come together and build a stock file, for example, uh, where you can utilize the stock file as a means to raise capital to then go and buy property. EDPF itself even has a stock file, where we are, in fact, just, we started the thing in January this year, and yeah, last night we were discussing our first deal. So I put together a stock file. I said, Everybody I know, guys, friends, family, EDPF candidates, anybody who's interested, come and join me in the stock file. I've got a bunch of deals that I want to do. Um, come and join me. Let's set up the stock file. Put some money in a thousand bucks a month per person. Over a year, we'll have hopefully a couple of million rand in the bank. And then we start investing. So that's one surefire way for you to be able to build the capital. Start the stock file. If, if you can't do that, bring your friends and your family, people that you know has money but don't have the time to find the deals. You and, find the deal, they bring the money. And and, and, and I want to explore a little bit that stock file model because I think it's one of those very popular um, alternatives, certainly right now, a lot of people understanding the power of you know getting together as a collective and saving money or putting money away towards a particular goal. And in this instance, that goal being property. What are some of the considerations that people should bear in mind when they set up a stock file for purposes of um, investing in property? Okay, so there's a number of things that you have to make sure of that, uh, from a structural perspective that you have right. If you have people that have put in 100,000 rand or more, um, even if it's over a period of time, you have to register with the Stock Files Association. If you do not, you'll be in contravention of the Banking Act. All right? So you've got to be very careful how you set this thing up and get the proper advice in terms of your structure. But the first bit of advice I can give is to make sure that you are registered with the Stock Files Association. Once you are registered, you can take deposits of 100,000 or more up to 30 million rand. When you hit 30 million rand, however, which hopefully one day you will be able to do, but if you hit 30 million rand, then you need to actually get a banking license, which is a hell of a lot more complicated. Um, So I would recommend that you don't go that high. When you get to a certain level, start another stock file. But if you get 100,000 or more, you have to register. So that's the most important thing because if you're not registered, you could get fined or even arrested for taking people's money without the proper licensing, etc. That's the first thing. Then, number two, you need a system. You need a system to manage the money, the people, um, your constitution. Another important thing, you need a constitution. Uh, Because without the constitution, you don't know how the thing is being governed. The constitution sets out the rights and responsibilities 
um, regulations of how the stock file is managed. Okay. So from a governance perspective, you have to have a constitution. You have to have at least a chairman, a company secretary or stock file secretary, and a treasurer. Those are the minimum requirements when you set up a stock file. I've seen a lot of stock files out there that fall very partial, partial of those different compliance um, matters. Yeah. So those are the key considerations in terms of setting up. In terms of your management, I personally will not want to manage a stock file. It is a hang of a lot of work. So I use a platform called Stockfella, um, S-T-O-K-F-E-L-L-A, Stockfella. They are an uh, institute that has won the MPN um, Apple Award, uh, Apple VO Award already. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal institution. I use them uh, for my stock file, and, uh, and they do all the management. I don't need to worry about anything except our monthly meetings. So every month we have a meeting. That's another thing. Transparency is important. If you are not transparent in your stock file and people can't see what's going on, they will accuse you of taking the money. I can guarantee you that. So make sure there's transparency. And, and I'm happy with Stockfeller because they allow that kind of transparency. I'm not trying to sell this service. I'm just saying that's the, the platform we use. So you need a platform or a, a methodology in order to manage not just the money, but the people. Then make sure that the constitution stipulates how you spend the money. Because you can then go off and spend the money any way you like. And again, you'll be accused of using people's money uh, for your own ends. Make sure that the, the, the group, um, when you meet and you have a quorum, that is, uh, they say so many people have to be in the meeting. That's what you call a quorum in order to make that meeting legitimate. Once you know that your quorum is there, you can then vote on any deals that have come onto the table. And then obviously make sure that in your constitution that stipulates how many people have to vote for a deal to be recognized and approved. Then you can withdraw the money out of the bank account, wherever the bank account is set up, and you can then do your investment. So yeah. those are just some of the key considerations that you have to always remember and, and put in place. And of course, you know, the Stockfill model is quite a lucrative way to be able to raise capital in the event where you don't have your own, because you're essentially using the pulling buying power of a collective. And, you know, one of the big things, and we've certainly covered it right here on the Private Property Podcast, is the issue of governance and ensuring that as a stock file, you, you have the right governance structures in place. Because I think a lot of stock files, not just property stock files, just stock files in general, tend to... Um, you know, not have the best governance structures. And that's where they sometimes can, or we hear some of the horror stories around what happens to the money. Now, Joel, before we wrap, you know, any three tips that you'd like to give to entrepreneurs uh, or even property investors who want to be, who want to raise capital um, and they currently don't have, you know, ways to navigate where to even knock, which they don't know which doors to knock. They're not quite certain how to best navigate that space. What are the three tips you would give to those property entrepreneurs? Okay, so yeah, so the best tips I can give number one, find the best deals. <laughs> That's the most important. If you have the right deal, the money will follow. So find the best deals. Number two, um, get a circle of friends or acquaintances that actually have money. You don't want people like yourself who don't have money to be part of your investor group. You want people who actually have money. Um, so, so surround yourself with people who have money and are looking for deals. And then number three, make sure that you put the correct structure in place. Without the correct structure, everything you do is going to fail. So those are my three top tips for anybody who wants to raise capital for their property opportunity. Nigel, we're going to leave it there this evening. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Absolute pleasure. And thank you for having me again, Zama. If anybody wants to contact me, they can be free to do so. You can share my details. I'm quite happy for you to share my details. And people can contact me if they have any further questions. They can email me or even phone. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Nigel. And of course, his contact details are right here below on this uh, Facebook um, post. So you are more than welcome to reach out to him should you need help in finding and raising capital. And those three tips, again, is to find the best deals, surround yourself with people who have money, and lastly, to make sure that you structure um, the, the, the deal effectively or efficiently, rather. And of course, that is a wrap from me uh, right here on the Private Property Podcast. Remember to enter that competition to stand a chance of winning that 1,000 Rand price. All you have to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel and take a screenshot and show it right here on Facebook. And on Friday, we'll be announcing the two winners who are going to walk around or walk away rather with that 1,000 Rand price. You can already hear the English bundles are slowly running out. So that means it's my cue to, 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 to wrap it up and... Uh, you know, probably take some downtime. Uh, we're back again, of course, tomorrow with episode 39. Until then, hoping you're staying home and staying safe. Hi, I'm Clinton Banfield. Our family and I live in Cape Town on the Western Seaboard. To be able to wake up and take in the scenery every day is an absolute pleasure. We probably have the best views of Table Mountain. There's some really amazing suburbs in our neighborhood. There's Milnerton, which is a central hub close to the city. There's some beautiful homes situated along the canal, which give you a breathtaking view of Table Mountain. A little bit further along the canal, you'll find Milnerton Golf Club, which is a great place to unwind with your mates. Then we have Bloberg, which is world renowned for its beaches, where you'll often see kite surfers taking full advantage of the wind. To top it off, there's a great variety of family restaurants in the area, like Blue Peter, where people love to meet. The Bayside Mall is a landmark in Tableview, giving you an all-round retail experience and a relaxed and convenient environment. As a family, we've chosen to live in Atlantic Beach Golf Estate in Malkborstrand. Our suburb is so chilled, it really gives you this constant holiday feel. We've lived here for two years and we've really enjoyed the laid back lifestyle. And this is our neighborhood. <laughs>